Hi, and welcome to our video on Mendelian inheritance here in our information unit. Uh, yeah, so this is a monastery and I have circled a little statue in the corner there. And if we blow him up, there he is. It's uh, the one and only Gregor Mendel who did work on peas at this monastery and is immortalized in a statue on the monastery grounds. So he must have done something important. Let's figure out what he did. So the question here is how are genes inherited? And uh, there's the man himself, 1822 to 1884. And here we're going to talk about what he did and what his uh, laws are and how he came up with them and what they mean for us here in our understanding of inheritance. So cool. So let's talk quickly about peas and why peas are a super good model organism to use for genetic studies. They're really easy to grow. Uh, they, you know, you can get a bunch of them in a short period of time and you can have multiple generations. It wouldn't be good to do like elephants because elephants have generation times of many years. Uh, they produce a lot of offspring. So each one of these peas is its own offspring in the pod there. So you can get, you know, thousands of offspring from a plant and they have really obvious traits. Like these, these peas are obviously green. Those flowers are obviously purple and so on. So that's basically why peas really are a great choice for genetic experiments and why he used them. So what Mendel did was he developed pure lines, purebred lines, almost like purebred dogs, right? For seven different traits. So here are the traits. Each one you can see very obvious, different uh, characteristics of what's going on in them and so on. And then what he did was he controlled the mating between the different lines. So again, nobody gets upset. If you control peas and who mates with who in pea land. So it's not any big deal. And so he controlled the mating. He made these, what we call crosses of the different lines. And so we're going to, we're going to have some different, uh, notation here that we're going to use. We're going to call the parental cross. We're going to give that a P we're going to say it's the P generation. Uh, no pun intended. And we can see that these two plants, we're going to look at flower color in this example. We, we've got a purple flower phenotype and a white flower phenotype, and we're going to cross them. And then what Mendel did is he counted the number and types of the F1 offspring. And so the F1 is the first generation, the filial generation, first generation. And we can see that uh, everybody's purple now. So that's interesting. Mendel did this for every trait that he looked at. And he noticed that in each case, every time he did this, the F1 always showed only one of the two traits. The other trait seemed to have disappeared, which was interesting because notions of inheritance in the late 1800s really dealt with this blending notion, this blending model, where it would suggest like tall and short come together. You get like middle size, right? You blend them together. Uh, purple and white flowers, you put them together. Maybe you get like a puce, something like that, you know, some, some sort of flower color like that, but he didn't see that. And then what he did was he took the F1s and he mated them with themselves. So here's our F1 cross, right? We're, we're crossing our two purple flowers from the F1 generation. And then he does the same thing. He counts the number and types of F2s. So what he finds is he finds the white flowers come back, which is uh, pretty interesting. <laughs> if you think about it, the, the, that white trait is reappearing. And he notes this in every phenotype that he looks at. The phenotype that disappeared in the F1 always come back in the F2. And not only do they reappear, but they reappear in a regular predictable ratio. So this is his actual data looking at these seven traits. And I've gone ahead and in that last column, I put the ratio down and you can see that it's always around three to one. And if we go and we take the average of all of them, it's 2.98 to one. So it's not exactly three to one. And we can talk more about that a little bit later, but it's really, really close to three to one. If we rounded 2.98 to the nearest whole number, it would easily round to three to one. And so that's Mendel's experiment. That's what he did. So why is that happening? Well, in order to understand that Mendel came up with some laws, I'm giving you the modern English version of these laws here, but I think you'll, I think they'll still, they'll still help to explain what's going on. So the first law that Mendel comes up with is this law of segregation. And so what he says is that, uh, peas have two copies of each gene again, not his words, our words. So we're going to say that peas are diploid where they're sexually reproducing. So they have two copies of each gene 
and we're going to call the different versions of each gene the alleles that the P has. We need to have a sort of a way of tracking this. We're going to say that big P, capital P, is the purple allele, and lowercase p is the white allele. So in the parental cross, since they're purebred, we've got a big P, big P, capital P, capital P plant, and a lowercase p, lowercase p plant. That's what we cross. P's are diploid, but each P is only going to transmit one allele to its offspring. So the purple parent is going to give a big P allele, and the white parent is going to give a little P allele. So that F1 is big P, little p in our accounting. Why does this happen, right? Why do we only give one copy of each trait? Well, hopefully, by the time that we're watching this video, we know from our understanding of meiosis, and if you don't have that understanding, I would encourage you to go back, that during meiosis, we wind up only transmitting one of each chromosome to the gametes. So gametes only bring one of each of the two copies of each chromosome that the organism who makes the gametes has, right? One member of the homologous pair gets transmitted. So meiosis is why segregation happens. Again, Mendel didn't know that. He doesn't know anything about meiosis, but we know that this is in fact the case now. The other thing that helps explain this and what helps explain that F1 only showing purple is the law of dominance. The idea here being that there are two different alleles, a dominant allele and a recessive allele. The dominant allele in organisms that have one of each will always determine the phenotype. So the F1 is big P, little p. Since it has a big P, big P is the dominant, big P is a purple color. So the F1 has a purple color. Why, why does this happen on a biological reason? You got to think about proteins and how proteins work. And let's, let's use our example of purple and white here. Think about the big P allele as giving the organism the proteins it needs to make a purple pigment. Think about the little P allele as giving the organism proteins that don't do that. They don't make any color. So if you don't make any color, you're going to wind up being white. But if you do have a big P allele, you're going to wind up being purple. So Big P, big P, what we would call homozygous dominant, right? Because it's got two copies of the dominant allele. They make purple. And little p, little p, homozygous recessive, because they have two copies of the recessive allele, they make white. Big P, little p, since they have different copies, right? One of each. We're going to call them heterozygous, hetero meaning different. And since they get one copy of the purple allele, that gives them the proteins they need to make purple, even though the white is giving them, you know, proteins that don't make any color. The fact that there is a purple pigment protein production machinery going on in there means that it's going to be purple. So just to recap this, right? Little p, little p doesn't have any machinery to make purple. Big p, little p makes purple and big p, big p also makes purple. Let's pause here and let's talk about a misconception here. Dominant in the way that we use them in Mendelian genetics does not mean like the best or strong or even good. Dominant only means that in the heterozygote, the organism that has one copy of each, it's going to show the phenotype, right? It's going to control the phenotype. So purple is dominant, not because purple plants are better than white plants, but because when you have a purple allele and a white allele, you show purple. That's what it means. This is Woody Guthrie. He died of Huntington's chorea, which is a terrible, terrible disease. And it's a dominant disease. You only need one copy of the allele in order to get that disease. And it, it destroys cells in your nervous tissue, part uh, population of your neurons. Terrible way to go. So now looking at the F1s, right? Wh what's happening there to lead to the white? That's segregation again. When the F1s make gametes, they're going to segregate their alleles. And so we have a box like this, and we can see that each parent makes a big P and a little p allele, and they come together in these four possible combinations. And because of that, we can always get the same predictable ratios of offspring when we're investigating traits that are inherited according to Mendel's laws. For instance, when we cross two heterozygotes, we will always get a three to one ratio of dominant phenotype to recessive phenotype. And we'll always get a one to two to one ratio of homozygous dominant to heterozygous to homozygous recessive individuals when the parents are heterozygous. If the parents are something different, homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, and so on, that's going to obviously affect these ratios, but it's still always going to be a predictable ratio that we can use. And that's really the, the, the crucial take home here from Mendel is that we can investigate traits scientifically and actually predict the, the ratios that we'll see in the offspring. What happens when we do two traits? So Mendel also did this. He looked at two traits. He puts them together. It's called a dihybrid cross. What we've been doing up to now is a monohybrid cross. We're going to look at the traits for uh, seed color and for the form of the seeds. 
round and wrinkled, yellow and green. So big R is dominant. It makes round seeds. Little R is recessive. It makes wrinkled seeds. Big Y is uh, dominant, makes yellow color. And little Y is recessive and it makes green. Mendel's going to do this cross. He's going to cross uh, heterozygote for both traits with itself. Uh, this is what he's going to see. And in order to understand this, we get four different phenotypes, all possible combinations. We need to understand a new law, the law of independent assortment. And it's, it's really very simple. It says that the probabilities associated with each trait are independent of each other. So just because one trait sorts out one way doesn't mean that the next trait is going to sort out in the same way. So if we just look at seed shape first, when we combine our two heterozygotes, we're going to get three quarters round seeds and one quarter wrinkled seeds. But within each of those groups, we're going to get three quarters green and one quarter purple because they're independent of each other. So we're going to wind up with nine sixteenths round and yellow, three sixteenths round and green, three sixteenths white and yellow, and one sixteenth white and green. And these numbers, if you want to crank them out, they're pretty close in the ratio up here, but they're not exact. And we'll talk again about why that is in a little bit. But first, let's look at this law of independent assortment and why it happens. And in order to understand it, you need to go back to metaphase. When homologous chromosomes line up at the metaphase plate, each pair of chromosomes lines up independently of each other. And this was the image that I used in that video, but this image is actually only one of eight possible combinations. And here are those eight possible combinations. Each one is an equally likely arrangement of the homologous chromosomes at the metaphase plate during metaphase one for this organism. Each pair of chromosomes has no bearing on any other pair of chromosomes. And that's why we get independent assortment. Let's pause and let's point out that inheritance has no memory and that the probabilities we get in a Mendelian understanding are statistical in nature. They can't actually be used to determine any specific outcome. They can only be used to determine the likelihood of an outcome. So a classic example of this is having boys and girls. There's a 50% chance of having a boy and a 50% chance of having a girl. If a family has a boy, does that mean the next time they're going to have a girl? No, of course not. It means that the next time there's a 50% chance that they might have a boy and a 50% chance they might have a girl. And that's also why Mendel's ratios in the data are not exact what we would expect because there's going to be statistical fluctuation around the predicted Mendelian ratios. We would think that if we did a large enough sample that we would get closer and closer to our predicted ratios, but we should never expect that any individual cross or the outcome of any specific genetic experiment is going to adhere to an exact ratio. And that's of course what we use statistical testing for specifically chi square testing would be the appropriate test to use here, but we're not going to talk about that in this video because that is a whole topic unto itself. Thanks so much for watching our discussion of Mendelian genetics. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can explain why pea plants are a useful model system for genetics research. What are the characteristics that make them useful? Make sure that you can describe Mendel's experimental method and the conclusions that he reached as a result. And make sure that you can use Mendel's laws to determine expected genotypic and phenotypic ratios of offspring from different crosses. If you know which trait is dominant and which trait is recessive, you should be able to figure out what the predicted likelihood is of any particular ratio in a cross. If you can do all those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.